unstable, which are the, usually the ones that are best to have sex with, right? So this HDAC inhibition opens up the world of possibilities. This is a step-by-step -step protocol of how to use valproate, valproic acid. We've been talking about it in previous videos, but how do we actually use it safely and for the best possible effects to increase the GABA in the brain, Leo? So, uh, friends, I've noticed that recently, we've re or I've received at least, a lot of questions about how to use valproate. I mentioned valproate a few times on my channel and on Tony's channel, and never really got into the protocols of how I've used it myself and what I think one should consider when doing so, including potentially very dangerous side effects that you should be aware of. But the reason why, by the way, is because I had a, uh, I still have a long research review on valproate regarding different uh, elements of our health being affected by valproate, including cancer and uh, liver health and uh, brain health, as we'll see, and um, de neurodegenerative disease. But I didn't get a chance to make it yet. I'll make it on my channel. Under doctor supervision, I'm assuming you have doctor supervision, and this is legal for what you're using it for in your country, which it certainly can be, and you certainly can have doctor supervision. Let me tell you about some of the, the issues to consider when you're using valproate. First of all, as I mentioned above, there are two forms, main forms of sodium valproate, or of valproic acid, which is valproic acid, which is a short chain fatty acid, just the acid itself, or it bound to something in some mixture, usually with sodium in it, which I'll just call sodium valproate here, although there are several formulations. The goal with the second form is so, so you have to take it less times during the day and also to cause a little bit less stomach or digestive distress. If you get valproic acid, which you shouldn't probably, you'll end up taking it three times a day every eight hours, which is a little bit annoying. And you need to take it regularly because you can't have these kind of fluctuations in your inhibitory calming, the main calming system in your body. So first of all, you definitely want to get something called sodium valproate or um, something related to an extended release formulation with valproate in it and usually with sodium. There are brand names like Depakote and Depakine, and sometimes on websites you may have to search the brand names to be able to find these drugs. First, let's go to the next, uh, to the next point, which is liver damage. So hepatotoxicity from valproate exists. If you take valproate at a high enough dose, you'll notice your ALT and AST in your blood work increase. Not by a dramatic amount. If you're naturally healthy, they may increase by 15 to 20 points. However, this isn't really necessary. This happens due to acute oxidative distress in the liver due to the short-chain fatty acid valproate. Interestingly, there are studies, for example, using, using another short-chain fatty acid called butyrate, which is also sometimes found in formulations with sodium, or like one called tributyrin, which I highly recommend. Butyrate is, a, is also, as we'll find out later, has similar effects as valproate. When combined together, can inhibit the hepatotoxic, liver toxic effects of valproate. So one to immediately consider is butyrate for a particular reason. We'll get into that a bit more later. Another one is vitamin E. You may not know that one of the main two effective treatments to slow down the process of cirrhosis of the liver, which is scar tissue developing in the liver, is vitamin E treatment and udka. Or udka is the pharmaceutical version, but tatka, which is taurine conjugated udka, may be more effective really. But so. I wanted to mention vitamin E here. The most important vitamin E for this purpose is alpha tocopherol. What I'm mentioning here in terms of the doses, one to three grams of butyrate, uh, 300, 400 milligram uh, uh, international units of vitamin E. These are for each dosing of the day of valproate that you take. If you unfortunately take valproic acid and take it three times a day, you have to cut these doses a little bit. I'm talking about taking it twice a day. Next, I wanted to mention uh, NAC. Oh, we can also mention about the vitamin E, something interesting about that. You may be taking telmisartan to protect yourself from cardiovascular disease or slightly from metabolic disease. Telmisartan is unique in, among the ARBs, the angiotensin receptor blockers, in agonizing a sister receptor to the target of cardarine called PPR gamma. PPR gamma is also basically more available when vitamin E levels are high. So anyway, that's vitamin E. I've noticed all, combining all, so I've, I used to add one gram of vitamin C and I noticed with this combination, people, their ALT and ASD elevated by like two or three points, barely anything. So it's very effective to do this. And I'll get more to why in a second. But the NAC is certainly so. 500 milligrams of TUTCA each time. The standard dose for cirrhotic patients would be 500 milligrams of, tut of UTCA twice a day, or sometimes three times a day. And then uh, 100 to 300 milligrams of R lipoic acid. If it's alpha lipoic acid, you may need to double this dose. As I said before, I used to add vitamin C. I don't think it's that much of a significant impact. 
Now, why do you want to protect yourself? Why do you want to take potentially this liver toxic drug and protect yourself from the liver toxicity? And will that still cause damage to your liver long term? Well, even just the effects of vitamin E on fatty liver disease may protect you a little bit. The other, th and you may be protected from the toxicity. But the other thing is this, because valproate, one of its advantages I'll mention later, is that it's an HDAC inhibitor, which means it inhibits the activity of histone deacetylases. Because it does that, it's actually in a class of drugs that are anti-cancer drugs that are used to treat cancers. Valproate may actually inhibit the development of liver cancers. The issue is you don't want inflammation in your liver. So this is an, quite an appropriate, not any inflammation, but you don't want it from Valproate. So this is quite an appropriate way to take it. So how would you prioritize these? Well, you know that vitamin E, if you're a smoker, may actually increase your likelihood of getting some kind of cancer. So you have to be careful with that one. If you're doing a very uh, oxidative stress-ridden lifestyle, you might be careful with vitamin E. But NAC is quite innocuous and produces an anxiolytic a reduction of anxiety in placebo-controlled studies in humans because it probably it reduces neuroinflammation. Mm -hmm. So I would look at that one. Tadka is very healthy and very useful for, for various reasons. It's also an antioxidant in the body. Arlopoic acid is also quite useful, but I would look at Tadka NAC and I would be aware of vitamin E in some scenarios. And I would consider with butyrate that butyrate is also an HDAC inhibitor, but a less potent one than valproate. So combining the two may also have more effects that we'll talk about in a second. Next thing I wanna talk about is the starting dose. Do you have any questions so far? Uh, I have questions, but I want, if you talk about the dosage and uh, how to deal with some of the side effects, then yes, I, I have uh, questions. Because I, guys, I was considering using valproic acid, but because of a side effect that he's about to mention, I, I held back. Plus, I ended up getting the valproic acid uh, not extended release. I didn't get the sodium valproate. And when Leo told me I had to take it three times per day and that I shouldn't miss dosages, I said, whoa, I am not good at taking my medicines That's on time. That's true. <laughs> he, skips, he skips all the time. It takes much less than people realize. So next, about the starting dose. So you'll find that the sodium valproate extended release versions often come in 250 milligram doses. The problem with these extended release formulations is you can't just cut up the pill and split it up and weigh it because sometimes they're manufactured in a way where they have to be intact or they, they have certain like, for example, the, the coating that dissolves, dissolves at a certain rate or whatever. So what I would do is start at the lowest dose you can, which is 250 milligrams usually. Problem is, we should talk about how to procure the, this stuff later a little bit. But if you do, you start with 250 milligrams upon rising and then 12 hours later. Ideally, you have a pattern every day and you rise and sleep at a similar time. But either way, upon rising, because the first 10 hours are quite important, I mean, the first uh, eight hours of your day are quite stressful, and you want something continuous though, overall. So this one, you want it to be continuous. So you, you do 250 milligrams twice a day. What do you do then? You don't titrate up the dose until you've went a week without noticing any acid reflux or stomach distress or a GI distress of some kind, including changes in your stool and stuff. When you have a week that's gone by, which may take you two weeks initially, or especially later when you get to a higher dose, take that time. Because the majority of the reason people have issues with valproate is they don't just wait. And they think maybe there's something going wrong, it's very toxic to me and so on. Remember, it may be an anti-cancer drug. So what would you do? You would raise it each time by the minimal dose that you can, which is most likely 250 milligrams. I wouldn't raise it by less than 100 if you could find an extended release in that dose. So 250 each time. So a couple of weeks later, you might be at 500 milligrams upon rising and 500 milligrams 12 hours later. By the way, there are 500 milligrams tablets also. So you might want to choose to order both the 250, the 500, the 1000. And so you only keep titrating like that until you get to what your target doses are. Do you have a question there? No. Yeah, let me get but to After you continue this, then I have questions. So the target doses, this is where it gets interesting. So first of all, in the U.S., sodium valproate is very little abused. So doctors usually will not, especially at lower doses, will not be very inquisitive if you're coming from another state about, first of all, in the U.S., they generally don't do this, about getting your medical records and seeing some evidence of you having taken it. So, so potentially, if you wanted, and, and what I was going to get to, is sodium valproate is prescribed for migraines in the U.S. at up to one gram twice a day. So you could potentially move into a new state and just hire a general practitioner and say, I have migraines. I used to get migraines for a long time. You don't even have to mention probably what kind of migraines they are and say, nothing worked for you except sodium valproate. You take it at one gram twice a day and now you've got, the problem is they'll give you this and you ask for extended release, they'll give you the one gram tablet. 
So it's very hard to titrate up. Now you could do it and figure it out that way. In America, it's also prescribed for bipolar disorder and for epilepsy. Remember, epilepsy is a disorder of having so low inhibitory hormones that your body gets into seizures that may kill you. So it's important to have dependable GABAergic drugs, which there are very few of them, to sustain people. But interestingly, for bipolar disorder, Valproate also provides a kind of calming uh, effect. So you, you could be prescribed, not calming, but I will talk about it more later, but regulating effect on dopamine. So what you could do in the US is most likely, you're not going to get it prescribed for epilepsy, and you probably don't need that dose, but you could get it prescribed for migraine. You could also find it online in several pharmacies. And abroad, it's much easier to get because this is not a very abusable drug because it's long acting or it takes a while to uh, pr produce its effects, its pleiotropic effects. And it's not like a pregabalin or a gabapentin where you could just take a high dose of it and, and be fine. Also, you'd hurt your liver. So wh what would the gold dose be depending on what, what you're going through? So you might find a 500 milligrams to a gram twice a day to be sufficient to do something to likely reduce your anxiety. It would increase, we'll talk about some of the other benefits, to likely decrease your anxiety, stabilize you maybe during a difficult time. Maybe because you're a person, for example, that has hypodopaminergic signaling, but when you raise dopaminergic signaling, you end up anxious and you don't want to use an SSRI for some other reason. Remember, SSRIs increase this inhibitory calming effect, both through neurogenesis and through serotonin modulating GABA. This goes directly to GABA. Most GABAergic drugs either agonize the receptors, like Michael Jackson was put to sleep by taking GABA-A agonists. Benzos, like Xanax, are GABA-A modulators that open the receptor up for GABA. Phenobut is a GABA-B agonist. Sodium evaporate is neither of them. It makes your brain hold in more GABA signaling. So what are the key advantages of valproate and why I mention it sometimes? First of all, it increases neuroplasticity in a way that may be beyond or synergistic with SSRIs and not through the serotonin system, so you're not developing any sexual side effects from it. Mm -hmm. The other thing is the HTAC inhibition makes it not only a valid anti-cancer drug potentially, especially combined with butyrate long term, but it also makes it such that basically when you're epigenetics, you're, the way you're in, your environment influences how your genetics are displayed in your body. Think, I like this metaphor that I've made up, which is very simple, which is like, imagine your cells in your body are playing cards. They have a hand and they choose a card to play each time. The card that they choose is sort of their epi, your epigenetics and your genetics are sort of the options there. So you may end up in pathological situations due to environment or damage in your life, like cancers, but also potentially ways of thinking that are hard to get out of. So you may not just need plasticity in your brain. The HDAC inhibition may provide some epigenetic influence to reverse some path pathologies. Also, I wanted to mention it's among the safest GABAergic drugs. So SSRIs, if you have anxiety, or beta blockers are quite safe. But beyond that, everything gets quite difficult in that you may get diminishing marginal returns with time, addiction, dependency. This is, I've noticed, so I've had a lot of consultation clients who tried to use this, in particular with post finasteride syndrome, but also with anxiety disorders. And a lot of them I kept in contact with and they titrated down and were okay. Didn't feel GABAergic deficits after. After three months, six months, so on. This would be nearly impossible with a benzo. And another advantage of Valproate, which is similar to SSRIs, is it's sort of an insurance against dopaminergic excess. But SSRIs do this mainly by serotonin sort of combating dopamine, which is a driving hormone for paranoia, schizophrenia, in excess, and bipolar disorder. Why I mention a lot of times Hollywood elites have bipolar disorder because of uh, often being involved with cocaine, dopaminergic drugs for a long time. If you were somebody who happened to be in this situation, you may think that taking a low dose of sodium valproate may be uh, an insurance policy against this mania that could develop or the results of that mania, which are usually bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. This drug has a unique, that's why they uh, prescribe it for bipolar disorder a lot. And by the way, it's prescribed for anxiety disorder and bipolar disorder in Europe, but anxiety disorder in Europe and not in America at up to four grams, two grams twice a day. But the reason why is it seems to just stabilize people's systems without tranquilizing them so much so that they wouldn't feel the dopaminergic effects. So while SSRIs can safeguard you maybe against the danger of taking uh, Ritalin or Adderall at very low doses, five milligrams, 10 milligrams, five days a week or whatever, 
this may do so without in inhibiting the effects of it as much. That's at least what I've noticed in many others. Have. Okay, guys, if you got made it this far, I know you have some questions because I have the same questions. So here we go. Like as a biohacker, if we're using this not for just clinical conditions and we just want to maximize our mental performance and our pleasure and how our brain performs, what are the benefits that a biohacker would get for it? From it. So this HDAC inhibition opens up the world of possibilities and valproate is localized in the brain. So now you're beyond just plasticity is that your brain is willing to make new connections and willing to develop new associations. HDAC inhibition means potentially you can think of it as undoing some, some decisions that your genetics have decided, I mean, that your environment has decided to put on you. But it also means that you may have, as a biohacker, anti-cancer effects long-term, preserve it yourself against neuroinflammation, it lowers neuroinflammation like SSRIs. A lot of the effects of SSRIs without one of the main side effects is sexual dysfunction or inhibition of the dopamine system, less excess tranquility. But what I, I should mention two more things also, but I'll mention one here. The danger, the major danger is that you cannot have kids while you're on Valproate. Not because, not because, remember- This is the reason why I, I didn't end up going forward with it when Leo told me that I shouldn't use my sperm that was developed or grown while I was on valproic acid to, to you know, have children with. So I should wait till all that sperm goes away, come off the valproic acid, make new sperm when valproic acid is not in my system. And then I said, whoa, I kind of want to do have children in the near future, so I won't take it. So, the re so just to explain, guys, because before I used to be very confused about this, I once asked the... Uh, a psychiatrist from UCLA years and years ago whether SSRIs could cause uh, like damage to DNA in sperm. There is actually some very, very small evidence, but in reality it, does, it doesn't seem to happen. What could happen is taking SSRI may, what I think, may alter your epigenetics like this is reversing and may make you potentially like a little bit more uh, passive or or could do the reverse sometimes the, the, we don't know how these things really happen like in, there was a famine and because famines for example in the netherlands caused people to become insulin resistant two three generations down and so mm -hmm. there are these things but in terms of a valproate or h second inhibitors you can actually cause like mutagenic effects teratogenic effects where your children can be uh, born with serious problems so but this is not long term so, right, so this is not long term. Once you, once you get off this, you don't have any real concern except are there epigenetic changes in me? They're probably positive and they're probably not negative and they're not so slanted towards something. Okay. And which is serotonin. And, and uh, if I have a bipolar girlfriend, then this might be a medication to help, you know, even her out. You know, there's a lot of different psych psychiatric medications to use, but this for specifically girls that, you know, have this crazy and then that, you know, come down like they're really unstable, which are the, usually the ones that are best to have sex with, right? Otherwise, yes. otherwise we would avoid them completely. <laughs> but if we want to have some wild and crazy sex with a wild girl, it's unfortunately true. It's this right. is a type of medication that can help even them out. I know they're less likely to go crazy and stab you. I know Tony's trying to make a joke, but this is totally real, guys. <laughs> okay, not not that something's how he's not hopefully under threat right now, but I know it sounds like he's being an armchair psychologist, like she's bipolar. Pretty sure she is bipolar, like genuinely, and she probably has to have someone before at least. <laughs> probably. So this is no, but actually, Tony, seriously, that is, would be a great recommendation to tell a psychiatrist if you, if you saw her, because it's a healthy drug and for the brain at least, and it's very. I mean, I have a lot of friends who've used it for years and really like this drug. But the same for anxiety disorder. So the same risk, though. I mean, her eggs that are or like yes, her, yes, yes, she can't. She shouldn't have children on valproic no. acid. Yeah, else? nobody can have. That's the worst part of it. Okay. I, I mean, if it wasn't for that, I might take this whole year. Yeah, and how ha and how you is know? this drug not abused when it's got such a short half life? Because usually, the shorter the half life of the drug, usually the more acute the effects, the more recreationally it gets abused. And here we have one that you say. Like it's got a short half life, but it's, it also takes time to start working. You don't feel exactly. you don't feel any kind of high or anything if you take it in the short term. No, you will feel you can feel it, not a high, but you can feel like less anxiety if you're very anxious from even as two dosings. But the the reason is because some drugs have a like remember how the response elements the GH causes an IGF one response element that 
or, or a response element that causes IGF-1 to secrete, which then, you know, binds to IGF-1 receptor, which then has some other downstream effects, like on MAP and other things like that, that whole process sometimes takes time, right? So maybe the HDAC inhibition, these are, these are complicated questions, but it, there is an increase of this uh, inhibition over the first, anyone can notice it over the first two, three months. This isn't an emergency drug, right? I mentioned it before when you need resilience, but I was talking, some people misunderstood. I meant emergency as in like for six months. Really, let me tell you what I think this drug is best used for. The, the metaphor I use is this. Imagine that you've just damaged your leg, and for some reason you must climb a mountain, and you're in the 1850s and the American West or something. You've got to climb this mountain. You can be stubborn, and climb the mountain and limp on the leg. By the time you get to the top of the mountain, you may have damaged your leg so much, you'll never not limp on it. Or you could take some weight off your leg with a, some kind of cane. And although you're not stressing the leg, and you're not, you would think I'm not making it heal or testing, I mean, uh, training it, what's happening is you're giving it a break enough to heal. The problem with anxiety disorder, and the main reason I brought up Valparate, although for other people it may be protective, as I said, to stabilize the mood real, but the, the problem with anxiety disorder is that anxiety disorder changes your brain as it happens. As you feel acute anxiety and you experience what's around you, whether it's social experiences or heights or in any, you're in an airplane, these associations with anxiety can become so powerful and they change you. So if you can just, the problem with benzos is it's such a, it's, it's not just diminishing, but eventually you end up sub the anxiety, natural well-being you have. But if a benzo could be, for example, you had a once a week anxiety attack and you were not an addictive person, and you could control yourself, that would be helpful to avoid the long-term ramifications of strengthening these associations of anxiety. So I'm talking about when someone loses their job or their wife or their, their father loses their parents. During that, that first six months, if, if you're already on SSRI or if you feel this kind of uh, extra anxiety, especially if in Europe, talk to your doctor, you may decide not. this is not a good time to have children anyway. So th this is what this drug is useful for. So the reason I made this here, guys... Well, it, so it just clicked for me. It's not... Because you're not taking GABA. Or you're not taking something that just acts on the GABA receptor. You're affecting the whole GABA system. You're versus like recreational drugs, it, it basically simulates like the actual neurotransmitter in the brain in a big rush. So even though it's short acting, it's the, like you said, downstream effects and the changes that it's making over time that give it its effectiveness. Yeah, yeah. cascade of, of changes. All right, the, the also length of cycles. Is something that uh, like someone could be on for years and years and then... Yeah, there are people in, on this in, in Europe for decades. So for long anxiety. as they protect their liver. Yeah, but almost, honestly, it's not going... It's not I don't think it's... It's not that It's not like lithium. There's a treatment called lithium which is a great treatment, but if you stay on it for 20 years at regular therapeutic doses, you will lose your kidneys. It's not like that, it's just you can't have kids on it. Mm. The thing about it, obviously, the, the longer, the men, more years you're on it, the more potential GABAergic deficit you have later because GABA is so tightly controlled. But something like using it titrating up and titrating down in a six month or nine month period may save a part of your life. If I had this opportunity when I was younger, during a very anxious phase, one of my years, I could have ended up with much less long-term anxiety. But just going through that anxiety and toughening it out and thinking, I'll just walk on this leg till it works, the leg never healed. Mm. You know what I mean? So if we take it for a couple weeks and then we come up, we stop. So it's a short period of time, like a trial period, and then stop. Uh, we don't really need to titrate down because we never really titrate it up too much, right? Or is it still always like titrate down? I, I would rather titrate down and not play with the system too much. But to be, to be honest with you, it won't matter if it's uh, less than 500 milligrams twice a day. Unless you are in a very anxious state and it did make a difference for you. You would notice that. And then does it have negative interactions? Other things that work on the GABA system, for example, GHB or Zyrem prescription uh, or benzodiazepines or Phenibut. Like these things all work through the GABA system. So if this is causing the brain to be more of a sink for more GABA and then you actually take more GABA, are we going to have too much GABA? Is it going to amplify the effects of other GABA drugs? Yeah, and it's not even just GABA. Any tranquilizing systems that you combine together, not any. There are some that are weaker. But like technically, any tranquilizing systems you combine together could cause someone to die of cardiac arrest when they're sleeping. 
Like usually, you know, you know what I mean? They fall asleep yeah. and literally like stop pumping. Like breathing slows down, yeah. the heart slows down too much where they fall asleep into death. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is an epidemic in my home country. A lot of people, they say they died in their sleep, but it's because they try opiates combined with benzos. But technically, although GHB doesn't seem to kill many people and Valproate wouldn't be the, I mean, the fastest way for you to do it, you shouldn't combine any of them. Because if you needed to take Valproate, you need to take it because you have a GABAergic deficiency. Any short-acting GABAergic things you take will take you a little bit lower on that deficiency. Maybe GHB being among the safest, other than supplements like glycine and taurine that bind to glycine receptors. Amazing information. It's really hard to find practical use for biohacking in these type of chemistry. Thank you, Leo Longevity, Dr. John Huge.